All right, everyone. Well, good morning. Um, we're go we're going to do this morning is move into our second session for deacons. Last week, what we talked about was really kind of establishing or establishing or the introduction of the deacon ministry. We began with this recognition that. We are all called to service, so it's not as if a deacon are the only servants in the local church. We're all called to serve as we follow really the, the model of our, um, of our master as, we came to, as he came to be served, not to serve, but to give his life as a ransom for many. But yet, at the same time, there is, seems to be in Scripture warrant for a particular office called the office of a deacon. So we talked a little bit last week again, and hopefully you read in your book about some of the missteps, some of the ways that this role has been interpreted uh, over the years. But what we're going to do this morning is we're actually going to turn to Acts 6. And as you can see in your notes, Acts 6 may not mention the word deacon, but why it is widely regarded as the biblical origin of the office and therefore the blueprint for the role's purpose, function, and necessity. Now, I had a professor that used to say, write a book, ruin a class. And his point was that if you simply take a book and you go over the exact content, you, it's, it's not going to be that helpful. What I'm hoping you're going to see as we walk through Acts 6 this morning is not necessarily going to be a rehearsal of every, what you read in the book, but it is going to provide maybe a different framework as we walk through this together. And you're going to see why this role of a deacon is so important. Because really in Acts 6, 1-7, through 7, I think, though it's not mentioned, I think what we have here is probably one of the best places in Scripture to see the functional role of a deacon in action, in process. So what I want to do is, um, actually, can I get somebody to read Acts 6, 1 through 7 to get started? And then we will kind of start dissecting it and walking it through. Anybody want to read Acts 6, 1 through 7? Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timian, and Paranus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they sent before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Thank you very much, and great job on those Greek names, brother. So, <laughs> All right, so... What we have in Acts, and can somebody give me just kind of bigger picture? Whenever we parachute into a text, it's really good to understand kind of what we're perishing into. What, what is Acts the story of? It's the story of the birth and the growth of the church, the kingdom of God through the, the spread of the gospel to all nations. And in Acts 2, we really have, you could say, the birth with the, the Pentecost, the giving of the Spirit. And then you have this moving on, uh, growing as the opposition to the church increases. But there's this vital ministry. We see kind of the key activities of the local church so clearly in Acts 2. Um, so things are going really well, even amidst all the opposition, even amidst all the persecution. The church is exploding in, uh, in Jerusalem until we come to Acts 6. And in Acts 6, we see, well, again, the context. It says, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number. And as I just mentioned, the Spirit had been given. There was persecution, and yet that was not stopping the church. The church at this point is at least 3,000, probably more. So it's, it's growing rapidly. It's, the ministry is increasing. It says the disciples were increasing in number. What does it mean by the disciples? Just when he says the disciples, who is he talking about here? Any believer, right? So the disciples were not the 12 disciples or apostles. They were any believer, right? So it talks about the disciples were increasing in the number, were increasing in number. So that, that's the context, and I think it's really important to see that because there is vital ministry happening at this point. Things are going well, and then something happens. And then we see the next is the conflict. So 
Verse 1 continues, And a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. It is good to know that even though the church is now 2,000 years later, we still are dealing with complaints from time to time, right? That is a part of the ministry. But one of the things that's pretty significant about this uh, complaint, and we're going to look at that in just a moment, but I want you to understand kind of what's going on here. So what are the Hellenists? It says a complaint by the Hellenists. What are those? Greek-speaking Jews, right? So there is a, a little bit of a, a, a division, you could say, just in the reality that they did not speak Hebrew. They spoke Greek, okay? And what was happening because of this language breakdown, this language barrier, is that this was a period of time where there was, I think, an overall famine in Jerusalem and around the surrounding areas. And so there was need for the for the needy in the community, for them to be taken care of by those that were more wealthy. And so they were just redistributing um, food and various needs in order for the members to be taken care of. And what would happen is that the Greeks, the Greek-speaking Jews, were recognizing that their widows, their, their vulnerable, were not being taken care of in this daily distribution. And so what happened was they, they began to get together and say, oh no, we're not being treated equally. We are, there's a problem here, and we are not being loved the way our brothers who speak Hebrew are being loved. And so this complaint brings into focus some regular, some pretty significant issues. And the first thing I just point out is there is a, pre- there is a presenting practical issue. What is the pre- presenting practical issue that, the, that generates the complaint? Their widows are being neglected. This thing just, sorry guys, just disappeared. All right, yes, their widows are being neglected. I'm not sure if they got any of this. may be the worst video for <laughs> Mickey and then good luck, guys. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but their, widow, their widows were being neglected. And so on, at, at the surface, it's simply an unequal distribution. Now, does it look like this is intentional? No, there's no, there's no evidence that this was an intentional, it was an unintentional inequality. But there's also a bigger issue, and this isn't simply a complaint. There is a hidden spiritual issue. And what is the hidden spiritual issue? They're judging each other, which, which is another word for what? Partiality or disunity, right? I think one of the things that's really important is if you think about unity in the local churches, I just, it's easier for me when everybody gets along. Like as a parent, the kids are arguing in the back of the car and it's like, I'm just more at peace if they're getting along. Um, what's that? No, I think it's okay. I think, I think it'll be good. We'll see. Um, but, but the reality is if, if, if it's just, we just view it as a matter of peace, I think we're missing the spiritual significance of unity within the local church. Why is unity in this new church, this really, you could say, the embryonic church of all churches in Jerusalem, why is unity such a significant spiritual issue? That's right. I mean, first off, the, the, the unique role that Jerusalem has in kind of being the birthplace of kind of the spread of the kingdom. But specifically, it seems as if, like when we look at John 17 or Ephesians 3, there is something about the unique nature of what it means to be a church that we proclaim what God is like by the way we love one another, by the way we are unified. And so disunity in the church is not simply, why can't they get along? It actually says something untrue about God, that we are not all on equal footing before God, right? That that there are ethnic barriers, that there are ethnic hierarchies, that God does not see us the same in Christ. And so that is a significant issue. And I think if you miss the reality of how important unity is in the local church, you will miss some of the significance of the role of a deacon. Because unity is not simply a practical matter because we want people to get along and we want to be able to execute the mission. Those are, those are certain elements of it. It is communicating something that is not true about the nature of the church. Unity speaks to the world of what God is like. He is one. And so the church is intended to be one. 
And I think what's interesting is that nowhere, again, in this story do we have this idea that there was an intention to be able to neglect these Hellenist widows. It was an unintentional idea, and it led to assumptions about people's motives. Now, does that not happen in the local church right now? You don't understand someone. Somebody doesn't do things the way you want. You feel slighted, and then you assume motives. Well, they, are, they don't like me, or they, they have... I, I think this is part of the way the enemy does his best work in destroying unity in the church, is, is bringing to a, a, an honest misunderstanding, and then we move to this place of assuming motives in what was happening, and therefore it creates a level of tension and disunity. So one of the things I love about Acts is in some ways it is so far, it seems so far removed from our current experience, and in some ways it's still so very relevant. So hopefully you can see both the context of growing ministry and really the conflict is really the, um, you could say, the incubator for the role or the creation of the deacon. But next we have in verse 2 what I'm going to call the challenge. What's the challenge? And so in verse 2 we read this. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. And the twelve, which is the, the apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples, which means the whole church, and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So I want to just ask the initial question, what is the challenge here? What is the problem that the apostles are trying to address? Yeah. Yeah. So, and specifically, there was something they felt like they were supposed to be doing that they were not. And it, what I'm going to call it's the priority of the word ministry is being neglected. Because it's important to recognize that the church was growing at this point and was doing well with the work of the word ministry because the word of God works in the people of God for the mission of God and for the glory of God, right? And so what was happening is that these guys were were neglecting the word ministry in order to be able to meet a very tangible need. And I think this is because, this is something I've just observed, practical needs are always more pressing than spiritual needs, or at least they're going to appear that way, and so they will tend to grab the attention of those charged with investing in the spiritual needs. So one of the ways the enemy can work to be able to destroy the church or to be able to hamper its ministry is to take people that were designed and set aside for the ministry of the word and get them focused on purely practical matters entirely. Now certainly there should be some recognition of that's part of what it means to kind of there's application of spiritual ministries and practical ministries, but that should not be the primary weight or responsibility for those that are focusing on the word ministry. Why else do you think it's a, it would be detrimental to a local church, or we'll say the Jerusalem church in this particular situation, uh, for the word ministry to be neglected in order to be able to serve tables? Why else would that be? It's the source of life, right? The word is what gives life and direction and energy to God's people. Absolutely. Amen. The development of the church, the actual spiritual development will be neglected. Yeah. Tied, absolutely tied into that, but just this idea of like there should be the word is what kind of equips us to be able to do and what all, for all the parts to be able to do what they're supposed to be able to do. So it's like you're, you're cutting it off, right, at, at the root. Anybody else got anything? I mean, those are two. I'm not sure there's too much you can add to that. Anybody else got anything else? It's word in prayer, so there's also the power that we uncatch. Mm-hmm. That we need. Yes. So there's this recognition that there is something that we can do that needs to be done but the word ministry, and, and you're right, and I didn't even put that right here, but it's very clearly the prayer ministry, the word and prayer together. So, I do want to point one thing out, though, and I think this is something that is important, is that they are not driven to this place of this challenge of this deciding we need some additional help by an unwillingness to serve tables but a conviction that they are being unfaithful to discharge their primary God-given responsibilities. And I think one of the key things I 
I want to emphasize this is because there can be a tendency to, in pastoral ministry or any kind of leadership, where we don't, if, if in any way, shape, or form, we feel ourselves too good to serve tables, too good to do something that is hard and that is menial, then I think we're missing the heart of what the passage is in time and time to say. It is not saying we're too good. We cannot do this. We should not do this. It is saying in reality, we would be willing to do it if it would mean being faithful to what God has called us to do. And so really in the idea of recognizing this challenge is recognizing that there is a submission to a higher authority in his designs and his purposes over even what we might see as the practical needs of the moment. You guys see that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that um, when God gives you the gifts, and if that's your gift, then you would be neglecting what you're called to do. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, I think it's, it's, it's a leadership type model in a sense. You've got to have those leaders who are going to bring the word to you, that are skilled in that, gifted in that, that can um, light a fire. The Holy Spirit will light a fire through those words and to grow the other, the ministry. Jesus, isn't it like the um, picture of Jesus and, and, and little Christ, Christian, mm -hmm. the way we're supposed to be? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're following his model, and if he was the one who was waiting tables, he washed their feet, then he has made it very clear that the path to greatness is the path of service. But I think what I want to just communicate is that though there is a teaching leadership element of the service, it is still the role in the heart of a servant. And if it becomes where it's not about me, or it's not about the servant, it's not about doing well for the people, for their good, it's about somehow providing a platform or a posture, a, a place for me to do ministry, then we're really missing an un the underlying point of what this is trying to say. These men were willing to serve tables. These men were serving tables. They simply stopped when they recognized that they had a something more important that they had to do in order to be faithful to the mission that God had given them. And that's just a, it's, it, it might seem like a minor thing, but I just love the fact that it was very clear that they were serving tables and that they felt like they couldn't serve tables if it was going to mean neglecting the main thing God had given them. And I just think if we are, and, I, and I'm just maybe something I, I put before y'all, if you guys see in me or if any of the leaders here that we are not with that attitude, if we are not being submissive, if we are not, not submissive is not the right word, but we don't have the heart of a servant, then I would encourage you to come and speak with us and let us know. At the very least, pray for us. Because that is not the attitude that we want to have in leadership. We still want to be working for the good of the people. So with that said, just this... Yes, Sherry. Um, reading this reminds me of um, Moses, what he had to go through, him being, having to... Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was his father in law, Jethro. Yes. You know, advising him. How is that, is that, would you say that correlates with what this passage is saying? I think it's a very similar principle. The idea being that it can't all rely on one man. Yeah. I do think, I, I think that passage basically talks about a division of labor. Yeah. Um, I actually think it's probably. Uh, it, it's helpful in this context. I think it also speaks to the reality of the need for a plurality of spiritual leaders, not just one. Um, but I do think what we have is in, that, in that passage is at least the basic principle seen in a different context, that it's not intended to fall on one man. And I think in that place in particular, it's this kind of idea of you've got under shepherds under the chief shepherd, which even that idea of Moses being Christ, he gives his spirit to those who can fulfill and discharge the ministry over smaller groups, if that makes sense. So still at the head of this would be, if you were to look at it that way, it's just you have Christ and he's giving his spirit to individual people to discharge, to care for smaller groups. Does that make sense? Yes. Anybody else have any thoughts, comments? I think you're fighting human nature. Because oh, yeah. Because wants to be interested in the self. Yeah. somebody is shunning them or they're not getting what they want, it's because of their looking at themselves instead of the whole picture. 
Yeah. Well, I think too, just the idea of the practical nature, like I can just think about for my own self, just the reality of how many times I want to get so involved in just practical details. Like I, I want to, cause I care. And yet at the same time, there is this sense of which is it in the best interest of the church for like for me to focus in that way like i don't i should be willing to do everything just as a as a pastor that ain't asking anybody else to do but at the same time am i serving the people best in that way and i think one of the one of the key questions that we have to always ask ourselves is is this following do we have the heart of our master who laid his life down and every role in the church is a is a sacrificial role anybody else have any other thoughts all right so out of this challenge then you have the creation of the role so in verse 3 we read this therefore brothers so let me, let me read two, and then we'll come play it through, um, into three. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we give up preaching in the word of God to serve tables. And then in verse three, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So what is the solution to this problem? Yeah. We need, a, we need a different group of people. We have been charged by God to bear witness, to, to, to devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. So we need to find somebody else to do this. And what we have is the creation of a new role. And I, again, I say, like, we don't see the word deacon here, but man, it is so clear as we see and move on into the New Testament that this seems to be the origin of the role and that is picked up and reproduced in every church to come. So... There are three things we want to notice about this. First, we want to notice the, the reason for the new role. The reason for the new role. And it's to solve a practical problem. And we're going to, what I'll do is we'll go through these and we'll kind of we'll dive in. Second, the nature of the role is that of a servant. And then thirdly, the focus of the new role is is the practical material needs of the people. So three things. The nature, uh, the reason for the new role is to solve a practical problem that, as we've say, already showed, also has spiritual implications. Second, what is the nature of the new role? It's that of a servant. And what is the focus of the new role? Practical material needs. So distinguishing this from like just the role of a pastor, the, the reason for a pastor is to deal with spiritual growth, spiritual life, spiritual health, the shepherding of the soul. The nature of the new role is a servant. And I would say as a pastor, that's still the role is designed to, uh, to, to serve, but they do it through oversight, the way a shepherd serves the sheep. And then sec thirdly, the, um, the focus of the new role is practical material needs. And then again, this differentiates it from the elder pastor because the elder pastor is primarily concerned about seeing sheep's souls, the individual soul of believers, built up and edified in Christ that they may be pre presented to Christ, make it to Him, mature, and finally see Him face to face. But the deacon has the focus of caring for some of the practical material needs that are still just as relevant in order to be able to get there. So when the servants are serving, what does that enable the other leaders to do? Focus on what they're to be doing. Yeah, and I, I think... I think one of the things that's really important to see here is that the, board, the Bible does not make this case of saying, hey, guess what? Physical needs are unimportant. Pastors should just focus on that and just these other people should just deal with it on their own. He's actually making the point that the practical physical needs are legitimately real. So I think at this point when they didn't have a building to maintain, they were just primarily talking about the practical needs of the people. Part of what it's being in the 21st century and here we have actually have a building which means part of the practical needs have to do with our facility, with paying taxes, with our budget. With, there's a thousand, the bigger a church gets and I guess when you're more established, there are more needs that kind of are, are part of what it means to be a, a deacon, right? 
And so part of what he's, he's helping them see is that these elements aren't, it's not like they're unspiritual. It's not like they don't matter. They matter very much and it matters that they're done well. The point is that doesn't mean that, that, that it should be the same job of people to focus on both the spiritual and the practical. And I think that division of labor, and you can say even the division of focus, the spiritual and the practical is helpful. And I don't mean to say that there's nothing spiritual about practical, meeting practical needs, not at all. As you have seen already, that if you are not taking care of practical needs, it can have very real spiritual implications. But the point being that that may not necessarily be the focus of the role. The focus of the role is to problem solve and to meet practical needs. Any questions about that? Well, let me ask this question. How do deacons protect, how, how do deacons protect, facilitate, multiply the ministry of the church? And maybe what are some examples? How, what have you seen? How do deacons protect, facilitate, and multiply the ministry of the church? Mm. Mm. You can see somebody walk over a piece of trash and you can stop and pick it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, that's probably more rewarding. You know, see the kids running there and excited about getting a donut. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a great practical example. The reality is, like, donuts and fellowship are, I mean, donuts and coffee are not like a spiritual thing. But what they enable... And being able to have and create, create, really setting the table for fellowship to happen, that is a great example. And I don't know, my, my kids are fight, <laughs> fighting to get in the door. <laughs> my girl are ready to beat the door down to be able to get to it. Yeah, I mean, that's a great example. And you said something else, humility. And we're, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about more of the characteristics of the deacon of those chosen in just a second. But, um, but I think, that's, I think that's particularly important. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But, but what are some other ways, that, that, or maybe some other examples that you have seen deacons protect, facilitate, and multiply the ministry in a local church? I think if the body of the church family know who to speak to about certain topics, the weight of that constantly falling on the pastor or the senior leadership team diminishes. Yeah. I think it's a huge responsibility that we're talking about here. I agree. And I think, you know, just let's use the element, just the, the example of stuff like related to the building. The building, this is an aging building. It is, there's constantly things, AC breaking down. I mean, I feel like every week there is something um, that's not working as it should. And then there's just in general kind of looking at it and saying, how can we best facilitate and use the space that God has given us? And I think one of the things that, um, one of the, the, the realities is if, you know, me or Jeff or, or Andrew are spending a ton of our time making sure that all of these things are taken care of, it really reduces the ability for us to focus on the things that are most important. And as most of you guys know, if you're able to focus on something, there's things that you can see and there's life that's given that you that simply does not happen when you're ha- when you're when your focus and your attention is divided in, in amongst a mon- of many different things. Yeah, so you know, just some practical examples I've seen at Lakeside. I've seen when it comes to facilities. I've seen just the, the blessing of having people that have stepped up in that way. Uh, when it comes to uh, events, set up, tear down, services uh, being we've got you know prov- providing and. Um, Presenting the Lord's Supper every week is a task that brings spiritual benefit, but there is a practical, real need. Same things with baptisms. Uh, same thing with um, uh, any sort of event, set up, tear down. There's a thousand different things that need to be done in order for ministry, vital ministry to happen. 
And I can just say that the ministry of service and the ministry of, of a deacons is a vital and valuable thing because I think I mentioned to you the, the story last week of being in a situation where, you know, at the last minute, two ladies dropped a uh, fall festival, weren't able to kind of step into it and kind of the, what, what happened to me health-wise, because trying to immediately take that up. And I can just tell you that kind of looking back on that, as I mentioned, I would have probably just not done it. And I think there are things as a local church that you'll just simply not do if you don't have the deacon support to be able to do it. Um, yeah, Jeff. I was talking to a guy at the gym the other day. He was in a, on an elder board at his church in Maryland. And bottom line, the pastor was doing some shady business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In the past, I've seen deacons um, serve families. That, that, that was how we used the deacon role. Mm -hmm. So we had a list of families, and mm -hmm. I've seen it used very purposefully. Mm -hmm. And then I've also seen it as just a title mm -hmm. and not produce anything. But when it's used properly, those deacons can get to know that those families, because the pastor can only be spread so thin. And then if there's issues, that can be um, then forwarded to the pastor so he has ideas. Yeah. Kind of and I think one of the things I would say is that we, we've, we've kind of dallied in that, that model. One of the things that at Lakeside, what we have chosen to do is to have shepherding groups, which is where our actual pastors have groups of people within the local church that they are taking individual, kind of making sure they're communicating with, connecting with. Like we want to have communication with everyone, but kind of subdivide the group, which is... I think a good model because there's a level of just shepherding that you want to have and, and, and connection you want to have with your people. But at the same time, what we also have is we have built in, I think, some, some good uh, people that are in place that are helping with like practical needs. So if I have end up in a situation where I'm meeting with one of our widows and they have a, a, a practical, like something's wrong with their, their sink. Um, you don't want me fixing your sink. <laughs> like, for multiple reasons, you don't want me to fix your sink. But we do have people in the church that I can re immediately reach out to, trigger, and then that'll, that'll bring about that solution. And that is the current model. So we probably will never move to a, like a deacon family simply because we think that's part of the role of a shepherd. Um, but connected with that, there is very, a lot of practical needs. So yeah, so I've seen that function. I, and I, I think I've seen it function pretty effectively too. Any other thoughts? Reading, reading that, what occurred to me, which is really as any of the deacons, but it's a, that's a perfect guide for most businesses. Most entrepreneurs end up doing way too much. Yeah. You know, here's, the, here's the instruction right here, you know. Get, get yeah. people on your team that you can trust. Yeah, and there's certainly, I think one of the things you see here is you see the wisdom of God, yeah. um, of just recognizing that, and I, again, it, I think it helps those who want to do it all. And I would, I would put my hand up for this, um, to recognize you're not strong enough, you can't do it all, and that's good. You need other people. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, when you were reading this, I thought of an example, and this is this is a, a secular example, but as an RN, yeah. There you work with people that are sometimes LPNs who can't do everything I do, mm -hmm. and you've got the uh, patient care assistants, and they certainly can't do what I do, mm -hmm. and sometimes you'll hear murmuring like. Well, I could give a bath, yeah. but then she can't give my medicine. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to kind of sort all that out. And That's a great... And patients get neglected, if I get hopped into the trenches too much, even though I want to, man, you learn a lot about patients when you give them a bath. Yeah. I mean, you really learn about their needs. But I can't, because yeah. who's going to do all my meds? And my care planning and discharging and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I think that's a great, that's, that's a great uh, you know, secular example of just kind of recognizing that there's wisdom and recognizing that there's not one job that we're saying we're above in any way, shape, or form. But the reality is there, there are certain things that a deacon can't or that a pastor can do that a deacon can't, right? But I also think, as much as I think there's practical wisdom here, I do think that there's something spiritually unique about a deacon. And I think that's where I want to move to next in verse 3 where we read this. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. 
And then picking up in verse 5, and what they said pleased the whole gathering, that's the whole church. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas. Uh, Parmenas. How did you say it, Mark? Parmenas? I don't know. I, th- I like the way you said it better. And Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Man, this is a beautiful scene. And I think one of the reasons that I, I think this is unique, and this is why I think there's, there's certainly some, we can see the wisdom of God even from a secular standpoint in this, but I do think that there's something intended to be unique about this. And let me just begin by asking the question, why do you think these people must be people of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom? Yeah, unity. I think that's, that's key, right? Anybody else got anything? They're not communicating them. They're representing Christ uh, to the people. Yes. They're examples. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think it's interesting here that he does not talk at all about gifting in the sense of skills. He talks about character. Now, I'm not going to dive into this too much because everything we're going to be talking about next week is all character focused. We're going to be talking about the qualifications for the role. But I do think it's really important to recognize that this is not simply a practical means to increase ministry productivity. This is a spiritually empowered group of people who are functioning in the role as servants of Christ to serve his church for the good of others. And so I think attached to this idea is this deacons must be practical problem solvers. Deacons must be peacemakers and unifiers. How do they come up with the number seven? I don't know. I, I have heard a lot of different, they may have just had seven men that fit this, this character. Scott, do you have any answer to that? No? Okay. Because I don't know. Because they selected them among the Hellenists. Yeah. It wasn't outside of the, the people that were complaining, I assume. They selected the seven from the people, the group of people that were complaining. It, it, with Greek names. Yeah. yeah, it certainly seems that they were, they, were, they were drawing them from that particular group to help ease, which was, there's wisdom in that as well. Yeah. Well, seven's the perfect number, like there's seven days in a week. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of reasons seven is a favorite. I don't think the scriptures give us a clear reason why seven, um, but... Take whatever best choice that you will. But I, I do think it is significant, though, to your point, Mark, that they were all, they seem they all have Greek names. It seems they were probably all Hellenistic Jews. And then finally, they were exemplary servants. So they were practical problem solvers, peacemakers and unifiers, and exemplary servants. Now, before we move on to kind of how they were chosen, I think there's a couple things I just I want to kind of spend some time. Why do you think it's really important that character? And we've, we've mentioned unity, but let's, let's talk about this and maybe flesh this out. Yes, we've already mentioned exem- examples. They're, they're, they're standing in the place of Christ. So let me just go ahead and tell you, when a deacon serves in such a way that you not because they seek the limelight, not because they're up front, but because they're just steady, faithful, serving. They are, they are showing people and giving people an example to follow. And it should be challenging. It should challenge the people in the church to say, I want to serve like that. That this is, this is an example of how Christ serves. Because recognizing though we're all called to serve, some are, it seems to be serving more. And you've all heard the adage, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. (laughs) I don't think that's scriptural. I don't think that's biblical. I'm not necessarily commending that to you. But I do want to to maybe lay a set up, kind of put this up, that I do think deacons are those that are supposed to set the bar for service. That's what it looks like. They didn't want a position. 
And I, I think second day, like, there was this sense of, I'm not doing it for the people. I'm doing it for the master. Right? So I'm working back up, up this, this idea of peacemakers and unifiers. Peacemakers and unifiers. Why is, and I think, you know, Dennis has already kind of touched on this, but why is peacemakers and unifiers, why is this a spiritually difficult role? Like, why do you need spiritual maturity to be a peacemaker and a unifier? Because it's hard to take the high road. Let's just face it. Yeah. When somebody comes to you and you feel that, mm, you know, in your, and you just want to, you take the high road. I mean, there's... And I think, I think even this idea of peacemaking, we have uh, in the Beatitudes just, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I did just preaching through that, like I guess several years ago now. I had the 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 image was of like proud people, the moment they're punched, they become bitter bitter or they punch back. Like that's we get angry and we punch back. We 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 don't absorb, we crumble, we get frustrated. Humble people, they can absorb a punch. They can handle criticism. They can handle critique. They can handle when somebody says something negative and they can deal with criticism. And they're really recognizing that the end goal of it is not about getting what they want, but it's ultimately about serving the unity of the people. So there is something innately humbling in being a peacemaker because you are absorbing oftentimes other people's Sometimes completely unjustified critique. Like think about these seven men stepping into this role in Acts. There are these people that are saying that there's this prejudice against these Hellenized widows. They know that's not the case, right? And yet they have got to work in such a way where they absorb that critique and then work to show that it is not genuine. Does that make sense? That's a hard thing to do. And do it in such a way where there's, you're full of grace and you're full of humility and you're just saying, I am willing to submit my desires, my thoughts, in order to be able to serve what is best for the people. And they just do it on their own. They do it because of the Holy Spirit. I mean, oh, there's no question. You know what I'm saying? And I know that's what you mean. Well, I, I think the whole idea of, and he says, full of the spirit and of wisdom... I think he's making it he's making it plain that there's no way that you could achieve this in I think human strength and human power. I think you can you can have natural giftings. I think there's some people some people serve because they're like it's kind of like their identity, right? Or like there's almost a compulsion. Like they either serve because like that's where I find my fulfillment. That's almost not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the people that are serving because the church needs them to serve. He's talking about a people that are serving because they care about the good of the body. This is a spiritually motivated servanthood, right? And I just think it's, it's important to recognize that this is just not people who are ready to kind of dive into this that, because that's kind of where they get, that's their thing, that they genuinely want something that is of far greater value. They want the good of those people that they are serving, and then I, I put practical problem solvers on here because I do think it's, it's probably helpful to recognize when he says full of the, of the spirit and of wisdom, like I have found that even well-meaning people, if there's no wisdom, can undermine the very ministry that they are trying to produce, <laughs> put it that way, with a lack of wisdom. And so part of what we're saying is just the wisdom of people who know when to speak and when not to speak. The wisdom of knowing how do I work for unity. This person has come to me. There's this complaint. There's this anger. How do I navigate this in such a way that I can bring God glory, that I can hopefully comfort this brother or sister in Christ, and I can also preserve the unity of the church as a whole? That requires more than just, you know, he's a pretty good handyman. That makes sense. I actually had somebody come up after the first quarterly um, breakfast. That's a lot of money for the church. And I think my first didn't come out, but my first thing was like, you know, we got life. We got air conditioning. We got heat. We got you know a bathroom. Same time again, just get back to that. 
Last week we had to fire two people. One guy was 72 years old. Mm. Greatest guy in the world. Do anything in the world for you, but messed up. He just had to do it. Uh, but to go into that, and I, and I told that fire, look, if it becomes an issue for the church, I know people that will we'll take care of it. It won't be an issue. And On the other side, I could have said, that's a great example because there's a thousand different ways you could respond to that critique that would have that would have made the problem worse, right? And you, it sounds like you diffused the situation, and that just requires wisdom to be able to do that. Yeah, <laughs> full of the spirit, brother. That's right, and wisdom. Skin, did you have something? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Don't have time to go into the, the full definition of wisdom. But yeah, wisdom is going to work for the glory of God and the good of, of, of others. And it's going to be applied, right? So a couple of quick things don't want to notice. Um, how were they chosen? First, the role of the congregation in choosing. Um, and second, the role of the apostles in confirming. So there was this recognition that there's this sense of like the congregation recognize these men in this role. And that's why we have a congregational vote on deacons. Um, well, one of the reasons, because we, we recognize that this you should not step into this role apart from the confirmation or apart from the congregation's participation in it. And yet, at the same time, it seems to be there's this blessing of the apostles um, and, this, and their confirming of this choice. And so it's still kind of under their leadership, but ultimately chosen by the congregation. And finally, the conclusion, in verse 7, and the, word God, and the word of God continued to increase, and the numbers of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So what is the end result of the, uh, of the creation of this new role within the life of the local church at Jerusalem? And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So this passage is bookended first by saying ministry was increasing, then there's this problem, this threat to this unity, this threat to the local church. There was this solution in the creation of this office of deacon. You know, what we will see, uh, what we see is the creation of the office of the deacon. And then we have this bookend on the end that says, and then the word of God continued to increase, which seems to be this clear divine endorsement on this role and on the function of this role and on really the decision of the elders, the, uh, the apostles in this sense, to be able to focus on the word and prayer and for these men to handle the practical matters of the life of the church. And what does this teach us? It teaches us that God in his wisdom has created both roles, those of pastors and deacons, but specifically that this role of a deacon is necessary to the life ministry and you could say the safe or the, the multiplication of ministry. And I, I, I kind of summed it up with this idea. So what is a deacon? A deacon is a humble servant who meets practical needs and safeguards the unity of the church. Because that is just a reminder that it is not simply about meeting practical needs. It's about the unity of the body and the multiplication of the disciples for the glory of God. All right. Any questions?